Hi everyone, Heather Williams here with the California After School Network for another fireside chat with Michael Funk from the California Department of Education Expanded Learning Division. And we are very excited to welcome some special guests with us today. We have Jennifer Collier, Julie Bush, Julie McCalma, and Priscilla, remind me again how to say your last name. Parche. Parche, thank you. Um, we are excited to have you all on representing some very different districts across the state and we'll in a few minutes have you jump into some introductions about yourselves in the districts but Michael I think um, we're going to kick off with a few key statewide policy updates so I'll first start off with some exciting updates about the governor's budget so hopefully by now many of you have heard um, the governor released his January budget proposal this Monday. Um, lots of exciting things in that budget in terms of expanded learning, a few key budget updates. Um, the expanded learning opportunities program is now set to start at $4.4 billion. And the very important thing to note about that is that that is ongoing funding. So that means that that money is in the budget ongoing unless someone specifically takes it out. So that is not an ask we need to make each year, um, but that is where the budget starts out at each year. And it is still anticipated to grow. So very exciting news for our new funding program. Um, there was also 937 million in one-time funding for ELO program infrastructure, specifically um, with a focus on integrating arts and music into those programs. So that's exciting. Um, we don't have a ton of information about what that means yet, but we will share as we know more. And then nearly $150 million to continue the ACEs and 21st century daily rates um, that were increased this fiscal year. So those will continue next year. So also exciting. Uh, we do know there's other concerns, especially concerns related to COVID and how that's impacting our programs. And so um, there will continue to be a lot of engagement with the legislature and the governor in the coming months um, to address some of those other outstanding issues, but otherwise, um, very excited about the budget. If you want to learn more, we'll have links in the description to access those. Um, so with that, Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you for some official CDE updates. Thank you, Heather. Well, welcome to our guests. I'm very excited to get to the dialogue part in the conversation because we've got three very different unique locations of the state feature today. And my hope is that whether <clears throat> that almost everyone in the state can see themselves in this conversation and benefit from it and not say, well, I'm not like that. I can't uh, relate to that. So a couple of things. Uh, I was on a call this, a Zoom this morning from state and federal program directors statewide. And I just wanna amplify what Heather said that the proposed uh, budget. Of course, this is January. There's a May revise, which where the budget really gets specific, and then the negotiations with the legislature. So we've got a long path ahead of us, but um, the 3.4 billion ongoing increase added to the 1 billion from the last budget, which was ongoing. Some might say, wait a minute, uh, how does this total 4.4 billion when it's 1.75 billion plus 3.4? That the math doesn't work. Well, Part of that was one-time funding last year. So it's 1 billion ongoing from last year, adding 3.4 billion ongoing to come up with 4.4 billion ongoing. One of the questions I got in the state and federal program directors call today was, hey, well, as I read this, it looks like this is five years of funding. And is that, is that true? Or so th there's all types of, of ways people digging in this and reading, trying to get to the details ongoing in budget language means exactly what Heather said. It's there until someone takes it out. Okay, so that's that's good news. Um, also, you know, what does $4.4 billion mean? Like, what is that? I just, I just wanna like ground us in this moment in history. Like in my wildest dreams, I wouldn't have imagined this. And of course, we even got districts saying, ah, it's 
too much money. I, what do I do with all this? Can I, if I've got, I've never thought I'd seen districts asking, how can I give this back? But it is, and that is why we want to introduce you to people here on this chat that can help you figure out how to not give the money back. Because if we, uh, I'll save these comments for the end. So I'm about started to preach there just a minute, but I'll, I'll go back to the details. So um, several, couple things that have been really urgent and a lot of communication on a couple of things I want to just touch on. Uh, for, oh, I was going to talk about 4.4 billion. So ACES is 650 million. Our federal allocation is about 140 million. So just with our state money, the ACES, 650 million, we have been the envy of the country with $650 million. That is more than all states, all other 49 states combined, times three. So imagine now when you just casually mention, oh, we got $3.4 billion increase in the budget. The federal allocation for expanded learning for the country is 25%, less than 25% of what California's budget is going to be. So by the time you get adding up ACES, 21st century, the infrastructure for the arts, the rate increase, and the ELO, Expanded Learning Opportunities Program, we're, we're like hovering around $7 billion or so. So how are we going to be stewards of this? That's why we're having these chats, bringing these leaders on who are innovative. In the midst of all this money, many of you have been writing, calling, emailing, campaigning, begging us to suspend grant reductions for the ACES program in 2022, like we did for 2021, because you're having staffing shortage. Uh, my own daughter's uh, ACES program here at Sac City Unified was closed for 10 days, opens up hopefully again Tuesday. And those that's attendance, they're not going to recoup. So um, we have heard you, we understand. Just remember, I've, I've run these programs for over 20 years. I get it. I, I totally understand it. But uh, I just want to say, we're not able and we're not going to make a decision on whether we're going to spend, suspend grant reductions for 2022 at this time. A decision to reduce grants wouldn't take place until 2023. And the data we're collecting for 2022 that theoretically would be used for grant reductions, we're going to be monitoring that, watching that. Here's the reason we're not making a decision. The entire educational system is discussing and debating school finance. And districts all across the, the uh, state of California are concerned about a massive reduction in funding due to the loss of average daily attendance. Uh, transitional kindergarten folks, advocates, are concerned about there's not going to be enough money to actually fully integrate transitional kindergarten. There's lots of points in the educational system where educational finance is being debated. One of the bills introduced last week by Senator Portentino was a proposal to change, um, move away from average daily attendance and move towards enrollment. There's another proposal that's part of the budget that is being discussed that gives districts the right to base their financing on last year's attendance or an average of the last three years attendance. I don't have the details right, but, um, we had an agreement with educational stakeholders not to move to reduce uh, a suspension of grant reductions, which would give ACEs programs kind of a hold harmless when the whole rest of the system is in disruption and debate. So that's not saying to you, we're not gonna suspend grant reductions. That's not saying to you that we are. It's saying that we are watching this in the midst of a lot of discussion about how the financing is redesigned. <clears throat> um, 
I also wanted to just mention to you that uh, there still seems to be a debate and concern about ACEs attendance. And we've said we should consider this one comprehensive program. And I've said you should consider this, the ELO program and the ACEs in 21st century as different funding streams for the same program. We've actually visited places in the state where they've got the ELO program kids on this corner of the campus and the ACEs kids on this corner. It's just not the way, it's not the best way to do this. It's not best for kids and families. And there's no criticism if that's people were doing what they thought they should do. We've kind of trained you to keep things in buckets and don't help, don't let these kids mingle. But this is not what we're trying. But we realized last year that people, many people have this perception that ACEs kids must attend every day. And we've said with the ELO program, kids and families can attend whenever they want, what, based on the need. And how do we make that work together? Well, the reality is um, many LEAs have interpreted the ACEs as more restrictive than Ed Code actually states that it is. Of course, it says the intent is that children attend every day, but that's an intent statement, it's not a rule. So the actual rule for ACEs programs is that a district has to create an attendance and early release policy. And when the auditors come, they only audit to see if you're following your own policy. And we've realized our guidance on early release was making it seem more restrictive than it actually was. We indicated that if you do this, you might get a finding when in fact that's not true. So we have revised our guidance. We've made it more accurate. It's now posted on our website. And uh, Heather, when we send out the fireside chat, maybe we can put the link to that guidance in there. So you can create an early release attendance policy for your ACES program that makes it very compatible with the flexibility that is part of the ELO grant. So with that, Heather, um, stay tuned. More fireside chats coming. We've, list, we've released a whole bunch of interesting new FAQs in December, and we've working on a third round of FAQs, and there'll be some additional things covered in the upcoming budget trailer bill to clean this up even more. So lots of in the weed stuff, technical stuff, but I wanted to mention those two things because we're getting a lot of communication on them. Yeah, thank you, Michael. That's super helpful. And um, even the governor and his budget, proposed budget, also acknowledged um, the declining enrollment issue. So that is something that is being elevated all throughout the system. And as you said, lots of discussions around that. So we'll definitely be sure to keep you all updated um, and engaged as that conversation continues as well. So um, with that though, let's, let's jump in and hear from our wonderful guests. So would love to start with some quick introductions um, around the around the squares just to learn a little bit more about you all and your districts. Um, so Jennifer Collier, why don't we start with you? Um, and we'll just make our way around. Awesome, thank you so much. My name is Jennifer Collier and I'm the Expanded Learning Coordinator in Galt, California. Um, we're a small semi-rural district um, in the Central Valley. We have less than 3,000 students and um, you know we're looking at expanding and um, seeing what we can offer throughout our community, um, planning and uh, just making it great for kids. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer, glad to have you and then um, Julie Bush, why don't we go to you and then we'll go to the Oakland team. Great, thank you, Heather. Um, really quick before we get started, I really wanted to thank Michael and all of the people who have been, have been advocating for expanded learning for years. Um, and I love the communication regarding um, really what the intent of the program is um, and moving away from the um, strict compliance mind to the let's look at ways we can serve kids, um, because I know that that is the intent and uh, having known Michael for um, years now, I believe that that's the heart of what we want our programs to be. Um, so I'm Julie hey, Bush. Hey, hey Julie Bush, yes. my internet might have been a little bit static. Could you repeat that again about the compliance mindset? Could you just say that one more time? The whole thing or truly that our, our intent is to do what is best for serving students. And that, that was it. That was it. Um, 
So um, I'm Julie Bush. I'm the currently the superintendent for the last eight years of Maple School District, which is a single school district um, in the middle of almond orchards, um, very rural, um, located between two farming communities um, of Wasco and Shafter near Bakersfield. And, um, and really quickly, the reason I am so excited about these opportunities is because um, I'm an absolute advocate for expanded learning. I um, used to run a program in a medium-sized district and also worked for a time as a regional lead. And um, I began an after-school program here, an expanded learning program and before school in my district, um, but have never been able to secure funding for it because our demographics don't actually qualify for funding. So having this um, opportunity um, to add to what we have been doing with our LCFF funding and also with some funding that we have from a um, collaborative grant with other districts for full service community schools, we've been able to run program, summer program, um, expanded learning after school and before school. So really excited, have um, great ideas for thinking outside the box because in small districts, we have to fly by the seat of our pants and we all have 10 jobs. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Um, yes. and. We, you know, we know you're driving the school buses, serving lunch and doing all the other things. So much appreciation for even joining us for a few moments today. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to the other Julie and Priscilla for introductions. Good morning. My name is Julie McCalmont, uh, Oakland Unified School District. I've been a part of the Expanded Learning Office for about 10 years. Um, we're a big district, 36,000 kids. And close to 10,000 of those kids get some sort of expanded learning um, experience through either after school or summer. So just super excited to share with you guys some of our ideas and to uh, learn from everybody. Hi, good morning. Priscilla Parche. I'm a program manager with Open Unified and I support summer as well as the um, full school year expanded learning and we're happy to be here. Thank you so much. So excited to hear from everyone. Welcome everyone. I think one of, you know one of the things that uh, was was talking with uh, Oakland Unified and um, earlier this week or last week, and uh, Martha Pena was we were talking in you know, a conversation and she she mentioned something that I just I'd asked Julie and Priscilla to to start off with sharing and that was in the midst of being in the circumstance that many people are in, like, what do I do this year with this money? Yeah. Uh, we don't have, haven't had much time to plan. And there was this description of, well, we just decided to do for now three things. And that we know it's a short-term solution, but it's three things. And we're going to ask everyone to address how they're going to do these three things. So Oakland, share with us. Sure. So yeah, I know this whole concept of, you know, more money, more problems. And we, I feel like we've finally come to the other side of that. So um, what we're proposing to our current lead agencies is um, we, we've, set a, we've set a priority of top three things we wanna do with this money this year. First one is anyone who's on a waiting list to get into an after school program, let's get them off the waiting list. As much as is possible within our staffing constraints that we're all experiencing across the nation, right? So first things first, if you're on a wait list, let's, let's get you into program. The second thing that, and this is something that we've been really struggling with in, in expanded learning, and now the, the grant is kind of like naming it, is serving TKs. So that the grant names it and also names it as 10 to 1, which is super exciting. So a second priority is let's bring TKs. Oops, are we okay? Um, every, we're, everything we're that we've always dreamt of doing for summer, we can actually do it this year um, because of the fun. So we're spending a lot of energy of reimagining summer, redesigning summer, and getting our as many lead agencies as possible to serve as many students as possible this summer. Those I think yeah. are the three, is that right, Priscilla? Absolutely. And I would just add from our last meeting with our agency directors, also there's a, a portion of dream big 
right? Because we are holding this very centrally um, and they are on the ground at their program. So they know it's actually gonna be the most impactful for their communities. So we've also asked them to go back and think like, what are some things we didn't think about that you really think would be impactful for your students that could change their, could change their experience in, in expanded learning. Um, so we're hoping to get some even more wild ideas from that as well. And then we're gonna share with you guys um, a PDF of our one pager of what we're giving. It's like a little planning doc for our lead agencies and it's how we're gonna give them the money as long as they have a set plan of, of what they wanna do and how many extra additional kids they wanna serve. That's how we're gonna apportion out um, the funds you know, from February to May. So uh, we'll share that out with you guys um, later or, or uh, Heather will we'll make sure that's available. Yeah, we've got, <clears throat> um... We'll, we'll just put the link to that document when we send out the chat. Um, so thank you, Oakland. Um, and Priscilla, I know one of your points of focus is one of the architects of this amazing summer experience, which Oakland's been doing for a long time. And after we hear from uh, Julie and Jennifer, uh, maybe we'll take a minute and you can just share a little bit of the slide deck that you brought about summer. but. Uh, Julie Bush, you are a superintendent and a principal, and as Heather mentioned, maybe a lot of other things, and that's actually a thing in California. There's actually have been initiatives that really focus on the superintendent principal. There's lots, there's many, many, many districts that are in this situation. So talk to us about how you've approached, you've, you've mentioned a few things, but you mentioned flying by the seat of your pants, not having this money, uh, this kind of resource before. Just give us a little bit of a picture maybe of what you're doing. And so other superintendent principals that uh, probably don't even have time to watch a fireside chat, but actually could actually uh, learn from you. Um, so I really like what Priscilla said about talking to the community. But one thing I wanna be really clear about, I am a um, superintendent principal but I am always um, thinking outside the box. So I recently went through about five years of advocating for funding and was able to get funding and um, demolished and rebuilt our entire campus. In the process of that, I also became a facilities director. The reason I wanna clarify this is because in doing so as a small district, we are only allowed to have as uh, administrators based on our certificated staff members. So truly we were um, limited to one administrator. So I was it, but um, through some very um, creative work, was able to add a 55% principal and 45% academic coach. So when you do the math, it rounds down to less than um, one and a half administrators. So I do have a 55% um, principal that helps me significantly and does very, very, um, just an amazing job supporting my teachers and supporting the curriculum component of our district because it really was impossible to do it all. So I wanna clarify that and give her credit for that amazing job she does because, um, because I do have some support. Um, but um, related to expanded learning, there are just so many things that we've done. And I, I have kind of a whole list here, but I'm gonna start with when we started a program to begin with, like Priscilla said, we, listen, we wanted to listen to our community. So we reached out to our community and we said, what do you need? What do your kids need? Well, they wanted homework help and they wanted um, the library to be open when they were off work and they wanted those kind of things. So at the very beginning, we started by adding before school care. So programs right now who are saying nine hours a day, that's impossible my suggestion would be open your library one hour before school starts, have homework help in there, and there's an hour. So you have the ability to do this. You have the ability to think outside the box. So that's one of the things that we did. Um, and then also I wanted to encourage people to really start slow. Um, what we did is we went to all of our staff and we said, we really wanna offer an expanded learning program. Um, but we know we have limited staff and limited opportunities. So what can we do? So what we ended up doing is asking them what they were interested in and what they wanted to teach. And so we ended up getting staff who wanted to teach um, robotics and cooking and crafts and fitness and sewing and start a track club and do painting and ceramics. 
And so how we set that up is we set that up in six or eight week blocks. And so we had multiple programs running and they were running simultaneously and they backed up to each other. Um, so it did go the entire school year, but, um, but it was not somebody committing to 180 days. It was really people working for short amounts of time. And that really helped me also to staff because people are also saying one of their biggest concerns, we don't have staff, we don't know what to do. Um, so, so we did that. We've also worked to bring in um, vendors. So people like we had, we hired people and this was, this is the thing I would like to really talk to the districts who are saying, well, I already have ACES, I already have 21st century. We're really at the brink. We cannot add anything else. I'm like, think about the um, programs that you are running and the things that you've always wanted to do, but you couldn't do. Um, so think about adding, I've, I worked for 12 years as a liaison, a certificated teacher liaison with expanded learning programs before I ran the program. So think about bringing in your liaisons if you don't have those. Many larger districts have them, but think about trying to do that. Think about bringing coaches in. Think about hiring um, mariachi and folklorico or whatever fits your, um, you know, your your climate, your community. Um, think about bringing in people who, who actually teach your kids dance or think about people who come in and do graphic arts and advertising and um, just there are so many amazing opportunities that are out there. So it kind of does make me cringe um, when people say, we don't want it. We just want to give the money back. And I think, oh, just send it to me. <laughs> but no, <laughs> um, but no, think outside the box and look at the amazing things that you can do. Um, and you can partner. I, I did see on a call yesterday and I was a little I'm a little disappointed in a response on a um, on an AXA call when the person just responded and said this money is just intended to bring in a community based organization. And it was in response to people saying we don't have any um, any staff and and I, I am an absolute proponent of working with a community based organization um, or many um, organizations in your community or people who have the ability to offer services to your students. Um, and I would just offer some my tips for that that can be phenomenal. Um, and it can be a little problematic just in the sense that um, you do lose a little bit of control <laughs> as the, um, the local education agency. Our challenge this year has been, and I'm just gonna give you a real world example. We had 80 students who wanted to start after school program in August. And we um, work right now with an organization and their hiring process was so backed up that we didn't get enough people until January to serve those 80 students. And um, so yesterday, or day before yesterday, one of the people who works there says, well, you know, I've been offered a different opportunity and I might need to move someplace else. And I said, um, no, how about I offer you three more hours a day? I can bring you on, you can be my employee, you can be their employee, we can work together. I really want you to run my summer program. You just have to think out of the box and, and think on your feet all the time. And I have a lot of other ideas, but I'm sure that Michael wants to switch to somebody else before I keep going. That was very Julie-esque. That was great. There's the, the, that was good. And those ideas translate even to a larger district. Those are those are great ideas. Yeah, and I think uh, I mentioned on the state and fiscal call earlier today that um, Gloria Halley from Butte County was in conversation with Paradise Union where the campfire was. And they've determined that their best fit is for the Parks and Rec Department to be the primary provider at their parks and rec facilities in partnership with the Boys and Girls Club. So there's lots of, lots of anything is possible. In fact, we were told by Department of Finance and the Ledge staff last fall, if the education code doesn't say that you can't do something, you probably can. Of course, as long as it's expanded learning, and not during the school day, right? But the, the way you can partner and configure this thing, the, the creativity is boundless. Jennifer, what, what's, what's your story? What's happened? What's my story? Julie, hard act to follow, friend. Um, super exciting though. I'm inspired just by listening to what we've heard so far. Um, so in Galt, um, you know, we 
we are fortunate to have three schools with ACEs already. And so as we're looking at how we're going to expand, it's truly expansion. It's really bringing on four more schools, including a preschool. And how are we going to really get creative in providing a space for our littles and making sure um, that's safe for them and, and, and really meeting the need of families. Um, some of the things that I, I have actually just two quick things that I wanna highlight. Um, one in our communications, um, we're having what's called a parent listening circle, um, which is a really interesting way to have a group of parents answer a series of questions while there's a group of listeners engaging um, and hearing and then working as a team to come up with ideas and plans. Um, as a, a smaller district, I'm the one who wears many hats and facilitates all, all the different communications and plan writing and implementation. And fortunately, I feel very blessed that I was hired on originally in Galt to, with Race to the Top. And I innovated um, here in Galt, um, Bright Future Learning Centers across our district out of our libraries. So I learned a lot there about what innovation means. And one thing I want to just double tap on what Julie says is it takes time. So when you're thinking about your first steps and you're thinking about your plans um, and you're thinking about, okay, how am I really going to get this up and running? Remember, whatever you have in your pillars and your vision does not have to happen day one. <laughs> You know, really getting your kids in a safe place on campus with a caring adult, you know, those are your priorities and your relationship building and, 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 then, and then you go on from there. And I also wanted to highlight too that in the continuous quality improvement process, those of you who have ACEs, this is a living document. This is something that you're going to look at, you're going to refine, you're going to bring in partners, you're going to, you're going to adjust over time. And that's one of the really beautiful things about the continuity and consistency of the funding. Um, when you're thinking about innovation, you're looking at that six to eight year window. You're not looking at six to eight months. Um, and so I just want to you know, take that collective deep breath and go, hey, yeah, let's really get creative and let's think about um, how we can move forward um, and, and make it solid. You know, right here in the beginning, we have this chance, this opportunity. So the other thing that we have done, um, which I'm just is my joy, I get to provide as the expanded learning um, coordinator, I get to provide engagement sessions. And what that means is we piloted that in our summer school, and it's a menu of 12 offerings from strengths coaching to social emotional learning to STEAM sessions. It's a 30 minute window that I walk into a classroom and I give PD to the teacher and the kids are in activity. We have learning and we have fun. Um, it's anytime, anywhere learning with Ms. Collier. And um, what's really brilliant about it is that building all these relationships. So my first trimester, I got to meet up with over 1600 kids. I went into 81 classrooms um, and, you know, getting to walk along campus, you know, and being able to say hi and, you know, seeing kids and like, that's my ACES teacher. Like, I know her. <laughs> so it's really um, phenomenal. And then across our district and then what that's going to look like in our plan moving forward, um, you know, and really just having those foundational pieces. So the, the four things we're really looking for in our plan is academic with reading and math. We're looking at um, social emotional learning with second step. We're looking at Gallup strengths and youth development. And we're looking at these engagement uh, sessions with uh, STEM with a big capital A in the arts. So, um, and then again, starting off with those, um, you know, safety and positive relationships. So, and please, my number is going to be in here. I expect you all to call me. <laughs> like I've got an idea index on my wall. I expect to blow it up. So <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, Heather, I, you know, one of the things that I've realized is that for many uh, LEAs that have not traditionally done summer learning programs, when they think of intercession or summer, most of the mindset goes to what they know to be summer school. And of course, summer school is very different than summer learning, summer intercession, expanded learning style. Priscilla, I think this is your wheelhouse. Do you want to talk to us about what summer learning high quality means for those that want to learn more? Yeah, I think, um, Julie, I can do a little bit of process if you want to get into models later, but um, I think for us, we really sat down as a team this year and talked about what summer meant, and, and a lot of it is around academic recovery, right? That's what it's been traditionally, and so we were really hoping to move it into more of a summer camp feel, right? That's where I'm from. That's where what I spent my 
20s and 30s doing, which was like arts camps, right? That's where I come into out of school time. Um, and so we really wanted to, to mess with the kind of model of like, here's some academics and now here's some, a little bit of fun at the end of the day and then you can go home and we'll feed you, you know? Um, and so we did a, We did a process this year, Julie, if Julie can go into a little bit more of what we did, but it was really to break that idea up. Like summer's not just for those who are recommended by the teacher. And they're not just for those who are having a hard time with reading. Summer is actually just an extra op opportunity to engage students in high quality enrichment, physical activity and project-based Based learning that is just pure joy. Yes. And I think it is important, you know, when you do your stakeholder work, which, you know, we, we did a ton of it. And of course, making your LCAP goals and all that as a district, you're going to do a lot of engagement. And let's remember there's, there's like youth voice and there's parent voice. Parents still want the academics. So we can't just throw the academics out the window. We got to integrate it in. Um, the kids, you know, when you talk to them, um, you know, some of them, they want to work on their skills too. You could talk to a 10 year old and be like, yeah, I want to get better at reading. I want to get stronger at math. So being an old teacher, I'm always going to want to make sure we don't let go of the academics. But here are like three ideas that we came up with um, uh, th this year as some models for how we can implement. So, so one model is like a, a district led model where you're going to have a principal, you're going to have certificated teachers, and then the lead agency comes in with the enrichment. Traditional would be kind of like academics in the morning, enrichment in the afternoon. We know that's kind of a stagnant model, but some people are comfortable with it. So we're, we, we still will see some of that. The second one that we're trying to pilot this year um, is more of an agency led. So because we love our, our CBO so much and because they are the leader in youth development, we would love to see them be the leaders. We wanna see them open up the day with a circle. We wanna see a lot of innovative scheduling. We want there to be blocks where we're doing project-based learning. And then we maybe have some certificated teachers that might pull out for small intervention literacy groups. Um, so this whole idea of, of what Priscilla was saying is like this camp feeling, this project-based you know, experience, we really wanna see that happen. Um, it takes a lot of work to make it happen takes a lot of planning. So we are gonna, for that pilot, we're actually reimbursing people a little bit at a higher rate. We're like, if you're gonna get into that work, we'll give you more funds so to make sure you have everything you need, no excuses, right, to, to make it happen. And then our third model, you know, that we, that we rely on heavily is like an independent model. These are organizations that have it all figured out and they just need some funding to help it out. These are year round summer programs that spend all year planning. Um, organizations like AIM High, Freedom Schools. Um, we have a program called Camp Phoenix where the kids are like camping on the coast for a couple of weeks. So these really innovative and creative CBOs, we, we want them to come along with us. We make sure that their, their programming is compliant and follows the grant rules, but it just gives our kids really cool and creative um, opportunities. Um, one thing I want to mention that Julie, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think our ultimate dream, right, if we're dreaming big about the funds and as it goes through is instead of serving 6,000 of our 30,000 students, right, that we have, a, we have space for every student to do summer and students want to do summer. Um, and it's not that they don't want to do it now, but that it is one of those things where I know that when I come to this, this is going to be an enriching experience that's going to be, you know, filled with joy and filled with um, public service and filled with all of those things. And then just more practically, we also know whatever we can't handle, we still want to make sure that we fund programs who can. So we still are looking at partnerships with the city as well, um, kind of what Michael was mentioning earlier, um, to make sure that there is space for, for any student in Oakland who wants to go to summer program. That's the dream. Yeah, and it, I mean, you guys will see a slide deck that'll kind of explain it deeper, but something that Julie mentioned about how if you contract out to a vendor or a CBO, you kind of lose some control. One of the things that, that, we, that we do that's a requirement for the grant funding is that you're gonna be a part of our PLC. So starting February 4th, every month leading into summer, anyone who's getting grant funding from us convenes with us. And we just, we go through the planning, we go through the supports, the grant requirements, and that helps us so that by the time it's day one of summer, everyone is, you know, on, on track, on board, following all the safety rules, and then also have received a lot of collegial support, cross-pollination of ideas, 
all of the all of the trainings and whatnot. So that's kind of like how we we heard everybody <laughs> to kind of stay. We give a lot of freedom. We we really let you kind of design, but we still kind of heard you when it comes to compliance and safety and things like that. Yeah, and another alignment is just through the enrichment, right? So picking strands that are really important for the skill building that um, you know students, parents, um, staff have identified uh, for summer: STEAM, STEM, arts curriculum. Physical activity is really important for us, making sure that that happens um, as much as possible in a lot of different arenas. And um, also some just like purely science, right? <laughs> Things that students are, are just really into, robotics, engineering. We, we wanna do as much as possible to support that with high quality, high quality vendors who have been doing this for years that can provide materials and training for the adults that we have who have the relationships with the mm -hmm. students and communities. We're thinking about some kind of summer sports league, partnering with our Oakland Athletic League. So, you know, just as part of getting to that nine hours, what if there was a, an afternoon, some skills camps and that could build up to a sports league that kids could could opt into. So we're, we're, we're brainstorming just like you, were, you guys are saying, was like, what are ways that we can make this nine hours as enriching and as engaging as possible? You know, not, it's not aftercare, right? We wanna really just keep it going. And I think the other piece is giving money to do the things we've always, Julie always says, this, this is what we've always wanted to do. We want our kids to go on a field trip every week. Mm -hmm. We want them to be able to have outdoor experiences. Um, we want them to skill build in lots of different places so that they leave feeling empowered. So. Well, yeah, I really want to just highlight that piece of around the nine hours. I think that's some of the, the conversation um, and feedback we've been getting. Like, how do I, the three hours ish, you know, okay, I've got that figured out, but how do I, what do I do with nine hours? And so I think the <laughs> importance of bringing in community partners and, and just, you know, all, all of the different ideas you talk through is really um, helpful for folks. And I do know we're running about out of time. And so I do want to give kind of a last word to each of our guests. Um, and so I think what I would invite you to do is just share if you want to add on to anything that's been shared with the group or something new, a new idea, kind of just leaving a last insight with folks that may be watching um, watching today. So um, Jennifer, I think I saw you come off mute. So I'll start with you and then we'll just go around the, the circle. Yeah, um, I just would like to encourage people. Um, when I'm talking to my kiddos on campus, there's three things that they want. They want to have time with their friends. They want to eat some food and they want to play. And I'm telling you folks, if those are your cornerstones, you're good and your kids will want to be there. And, you know, and it's, a, it's about making it happen and, and causing a space for that to happen in, in, in real time and, um, and accessible, you know, and, and getting creative. And I think that it's, it's, I just, there's so many conversations I want to have with these three ladies right now. I just kind of feel like we could take, just take off. So thank you for your time and this extraordinary opportunity. It's just been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Julie Bush. So building on that, I um, those are three amazing things. But and uh, in addition to that, what I always told my staff when I was in my previous district and wherever I go, um, my most important thing is that every staff member pause long enough to listen to a child today. Be that person who pauses long enough to listen. So that is really important to me. Um, but I do want to add a little bit about um, summer because we've done something that I think is phenomenally unique. Um, maybe I'll, I'll find out that it isn't, but we partnered with another small district and we serve both of our students um, on our district. So several years ago, we, um, we were in construction, so we served our students um, at their campus. Um, we shared teachers, we shared our community-based organization, we shared food, we shared busing. So my staff would take my children, meet their bus driver to get them to their campus. And we're about 25 miles apart. So it's not like we're next door to each other. And, um, and we can, we've continued to do that. This is, will be our fourth year. Um, so looking at sharing resources, we've also shared a social worker, we share um, a school psych. So this year I hired a psych and I have a memorandum of understanding with three other districts because I can't afford a school psych by myself, but I can afford them if other people help me um, share the expense. So those are things that we do that are really outside the box thinking. I had a dad that wanted to lead um, a color guard. 
And so for several years, we had color guard. So just thinking outside the box and don't do the same things you've always done because you've always done them. Um, and, um, and also think about, because people keep asking me, how are we going to staff them? The th other thing that I put out just recently to my staff, who can I get to commit to two weeks in the summer? If I can get every single person to commit to at least two weeks, and they're on all the same weeks, um, I can run a program. Um, and then the other thing is to think about splitting the time. Of course, we know we can do spring break and winter intercession, but we could always do a four week summer program and do a two week boot camp in August um, before the new year begins. Don't think of it as, oh my gosh, we have to do 30 days or we have to do nine hours a day. Think about the possibilities. And, um, and again, really think it's important to listen to your community, listen to your staff and always put service to students first. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Julie. Um, Priscilla and Julie, last thoughts? Um, yeah, I'll leave it with Julie, but I just want to say that I just acknowledge that there's a lot of tension and there's a lot of um, fear right now, even with the ex, even with having the things that we've always wanted, right? You, there's always that careful what you wish for saying that happens. But I just wanna encourage people that it's not mutually exclusive. I think we can acknowledge where our people are right now, specifically in these past four weeks, like starting up school again. And at the same time say, we're gonna keep moving because it's what we do. We've always done it. We've always been there for our youth. That's what expanded learning is known for. And so to just keep holding on, building that plane as you fly and that we'll get there eventually and all the seats will be filled. <laughs> And, just, you know, and I would just say, look, if you're really feeling stressed out and feeling overwhelmed, you need to get yourself to a school campus and hang out with some kids. Just like what Jennifer's saying, and just hang out with kids, talk to them, listen to them. They'll tell you the truth. And it, it's going to really help you get your mind right about this funding and, and what you need to do. And that's my advice. Whenever you're feeling, get off your computer, go talk to some kids and uh, you'll, you'll, find the, you'll find the path. It, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. See you guys soon. Okay. Well, I just huge, huge thank you and appreciation to the four of you for joining us today and taking the time. And um, I think, Jennifer, you alluded to this, but the even just finding time to talk with some of your peers um, and how generative that can be and like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Oh, that's great. Like, and, and so um, I think one of you all mentioned this earlier that even though you're districts look very different. Even this conversation is helpful in terms of generating ideas that could support any and all of your districts. And so much appreciation. Um, I know so many gems in the in what you all have shared. Um, a model we talk about is creative tension. And I think, you know, all of you talked about that in like really holding this vision of what could be, but then also being very practical and starting where you are. Like, what does your students need? What do your family and communities need? What do you already have? And how can you take like just one, two steps forward to start to get to that long-term vision? And so um, each of you are kind of holding that tension of where are we and where do we wanna go? And I think have really great ideas. And so, um, yeah, we just, we appreciate it. We are hopeful that folks um, who are hearing this, this has sparked some ideas. We'll be sharing links to a lot of the practical pieces around this. Um, We'll also be digging into this type of conversation next week in our Expanded Learning Opportunities Program Planning Workshop, which is a mouthful, but if you haven't registered yet, we'll be hosting that um, Wednesday morning and hope you can join. I know some of us will, will be there and be facilitating breakout sessions, so that's a good place to come and hear from folks like this and share your own ideas. Um, but with that, I think, Michael, we're, we're closing out. So I'm going to turn it over to you for your last thoughts. Oh, I'm, I'm so inspired. Uh, and not just by what I've heard, but by the passion that's palpable, you know, even, even through a Zoom screen. I'm just, I'm seeing and feeling the passion in this, such a student-centered approach, like take some time to listen to a child. Um, Jennifer's excitement about connecting with so many kids and going from classroom to classroom and Julie and Priscilla, like if you're stressed out, go hang out with kids. I mean, these, these, that's so much what we need at this time. You know, it's 
sometimes I'm, I'm just like so many of the questions we get are only about the technical. Like, do I really have to do nine hours or is it, do I have to do I and, and what do we get to do? What do we get to do for kids? What is our, what do we have the opportunity to do? Uh, this, this is kind of really in the weeds, but I mean, we've used some acronyms and several of you have talked about partnering with CBOs to run programs. Uh, we're not talking about your chief business officer at the school district. We're not asking your chief business officer to go run the summer program. That's community-based organization, PLC, Professional Learning Community. Um, what we're gonna try to do on the 19th is help people start a process in their planning. Please, when you start your planning, do what all of these folks have done. Start with thinking about what your children and families need and deserve. And you've heard me say it many times, lead with love. That's what leading with love means. It means in relationship with humans, with their best interest in mind, getting to know them. And for Jennifer and Julie and Julie and Priscilla, thank you for demonstrating so clearly how you're leading with love during this moment in time. Thanks Heather for hosting and uh, we'll see y'all soon. Take care.